Oh, look at that. All right. This will be a good crowd. So if we have technical difficulties, you won't, you won't beat me up. Awesome. So here we go. So in 1990, I'd just gotten out of the Navy. I was going to school in Valencia Community College in Orlando. I loved that city. I'd gone to boot camp there, and I liked the city. And I worked for Disney. And I drove the ferry boats back and forth from the Magic Kingdom Transportation Center. And I loved Disney. If you ever work for the, uh, the parks area, it is a well-oiled machine. Uh, the training is comprehensive and laid out. The expectations are, 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 are trained. The, um, the management, you call them all by first name. It's very light, but, but, but it continues to have that sense of hierarchy. You know, you know, you know who you're working for. So, Unfortunately, I ran out of money, and I came back home here to live with my mom and, uh, and uh, continue going to school and, and whatnot. And I finally graduated uh, in 1994, the end of it. I was 26 years old, and I loved Disney, so I sent in my resume, and I waited, and I waited. I guess they didn't want me. So I moved on and found other jobs and never ended up working for Disney. Uh, again, and I hope that most of you have probably caught that that was a really dumb thing to do. And I wasn't a dumb guy. Uh, you know, I got a degree in computer science, minors in math and physics, but it was just, it just my thinking was just a stupid little nugget to change my thinking to say, hey, you can't just send a resume. You got to put a little effort into this. And uh, had I known just a few little tips and tricks, maybe, maybe I would have ended up uh, working there. So that's what I hope with this presentation. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I, there's nothing I'm gonna to deliver today is rocket science, but I hope it changes your mindset a little bit about what's important, what people are looking for, to maybe change your strategy to get that job that you want. So why did the guy who only sent one resume to Disney, <laughs> why is he standing in front of you talking to you today? Well, uh, I own uh, uh, Bitwizards, a technology company. We do custom software development. That was my background in software engineering. We expanded later into managed IT services, so infrastructure uh, work that we do, and digital marketing. So I hire graphic artists and SEO specialists and um, strategic marketing uh, people. So it runs the gamut of different people. So I've hired every single one of those people, including this guy right here. This is my business partner and my best friend. And I always say I'm employee number one because I had to talk him into this. So I had to talk him into to going into business with me. He had a cushy job. And uh, these are some of our awards, but the award I'm most proud of is this one right here, the Florida Trends Best Places to Work. It says 11, it's actually 12 now. We haven't just made the list, we're always in the top 10. So we are one of Florida Trends Best Places to Work. A lot of processes and whatnot that go along with that, the philosophies about how we treat people. Uh, and whatnot, which isn't really relevant to the hiring, so, but that's why I'm here today. So I have a little experience. But it didn't start there. It started here, probably like a lot of you. So I was 12 years old when I got my first paying job. My sister was a babysitter, she was a little bit older, but this lady didn't want a girl to watch her two boys. She said, the girls will sit on the phone talking to their boyfriends. She said, the boy will talk and will play with the kids. And so my first job, was babysitting when I was 12 years old. And now today, my best friend doesn't even let his 12 year old be alone. So I don't know how I was in charge of two smaller kids. Um, then I did about, you know, mowed lawns. Mrs. McFadden paid me $2 an hour to work in her yard about six hours a day, five days a week during, during the summer. And my first W2 job was pull folks. I was a bus boy, Wendy's, Taco Bell, Sunset Beach Service, my favorite job. I'd still be doing that today. Just doesn't pay as well as what I do. I love being on the beach, hauling the chairs, and doing the sailboats. We did sailboats back in the day. They don't have them now. Uh, Beachside Cafe. I got fired from that job for stealing the glass. And I did steal the glass. So I deserved to get fired. It was a really cool glass. And um, you know, uh, water park is a lifeguard, body shop, uh, sing store. Was it? That's the worst job. I hate working convenience store. Worst job I ever had. I was in the US Navy, like I said. We got in the yards. So I wanted to make extra money, so I ended up working Burger King at night, because uh, we, we were sitting in the Portsmouth Yards. Uh, Disney, like I said, is a, a ferry boat. I went back to school. I, my degree, you know, I said math and physics, so I ended up do, working the math lab. I was pretty good at tutoring, so I started as a private business. My first venture as an entrepreneur was doing uh, uh, private math tutoring, and then finally some professional jobs, testing 
mathematician, programmer, programmer, programmer. So I think like a lot of you, I've run the gamut of many different jobs. So today, I'd like, I'm going to cover three topics. I'm going to cover picking a career, which might be a little late for you guys. We're already kind of into, into that, but I'd like to do that. How to get a job, which is probably what you're most interested in, and then give you some tips on how to succeed and excel and, 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 and strive and do better. So picking a career. Um, so I'm curious, what do you think is the most important? Uh oh, did I sell the ice here? Maybe, maybe I'll open it up and see who wants to volunteer. What, what, what's the most important thing when picking a career? Anybody? What, just go ahead. Uh, make sure you enjoy it. Enjoy it? Okay. All right. What else? Anything else? Go ahead. Either excel or understand uh, what, what it is or what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, you, have, you were going to say something? That's all I was going to say. I was like understanding yeah. what field you're going into and knowing the information that's involved to do the job. Do the job? All important things, all important things. Yes, sir. Making sure you can live off of that job. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Money. Okay, and, and I, the, the word's meant to be a little bit shocking, so there's a little more to it. But what I'm saying is that you work to put a roof over your head and food on the table. And we have been doing a huge disservice to young people, tell them to follow your passion, follow your dream. So you get $100,000 in debt, getting a social work degree, and then make making $25,000 a year, and you're in debt for the rest of your life. It's ridiculous. You're, you've got to work to survive. If you are the child of a billionaire and you can go through school debt free and you want to give, if you have a calling, thank you, good for you, that is fantastic, okay? But you've got to keep this in mind. You are getting a job to support yourself, eventually your family, you may already have families, you know, your spouse, your children, uh, Personally, I took care of my mom until she passed away this year. Um, I don't have any children of my own, but my sister passed away. I raised her son. He was a deadbeat dad, so I'm taking care of his two baby mamas, you know? And, uh, and so, and it's fortunate I can do that, but at different levels, if I had made different choices, there's only so much you can do. So it is a good idea to ask yourself what life you want. If, if, if absolutely. If you have a calling to teach people, to be a social worker, to do jobs maybe that don't make quite as much, great. But don't get into huge debt and then find out you have a job that you don't love. Um, so money is kind of a shocker, but I think ability and whatnot. And here's the thing, I don't need to talk about this too much because Mike Rowe has a fantastic video that talks about this that he says it better than I could. So. There are only two things I can tell you today that come with absolutely no agenda. The first is congratulations. The second is good luck. Everything else is what I like to call the dirty truth, which is just another way of saying it's my opinion. And in my opinion, you have all been given some terrible advice. And that advice is this, follow your passion. Every time I watch the Oscars, I cringe when some famous movie star, trophy in hand, starts to deconstruct the secret of their success. It's always the same thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have what it takes, kid. And the ever popular, never give up on your dreams. Look, I understand the importance of persistence and the value of encouragement, but who tells a stranger to never give up on their dreams without even knowing what it is they're dreaming? I mean, how can Lady Gaga possibly know where your passion will lead you. Have these people never seen American Idol? Year after year, thousands of aspiring American idols show up with great expectations only to learn that they don't possess the skills they thought they did. What's really amazing though is not their lack of talent. The world's full of people who can't sing. It's their genuine shock at being rejected. The incredible realization that their passion and their ability had nothing to do with each other. Look, if we're talking about your hobby, by all means, let your passion lead you. But when it comes to making a living, it's easy to forget the dirty truth. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you won't suck at it. And just because you've earned a degree in your chosen field, it doesn't mean you're gonna find your dream job. Dream jobs are usually just that, dreams. But their imaginary existence just might keep you from exploring careers that offer a legitimate chance to perform meaningful work and develop a genuine passion for the job you already have. 
Because here's another dirty truth. Your happiness on the job has very little to do with the work itself. On Dirty Jobs, I remember a very successful septic tank cleaner, a multimillionaire who told me the secret to his success. I looked around to see where everyone else was headed, he said, and then I went the opposite way. Then I got good at my work. Then I began to prosper, and then one day I realized I was passionate about other people's crap. I've heard that same basic story from welders, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, HVAC professionals, hundreds of other skilled tradesmen who followed opportunity, not passion, and prospered as a result. Consider the reality of the current job market. Right now, millions of people with degrees and diplomas are out there competing for a relatively narrow set of opportunities that polite society calls good careers. Now, meanwhile, employers are struggling to fill nearly 5.8 million jobs that nobody's trained to do. This is the skills gap. It's real, and its cause is actually very simple. When people follow their passion, hmm. they miss out on all kinds of opportunities they didn't even know existed. When I was 16, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. He was a skilled tradesman, could build a house without a blueprint. That was my passion, and I followed it for years. I took all the shop classes at school. I did all I could to absorb the knowledge and skill that came so easily to my granddad. Unfortunately, the handy gene is recessive. It skipped right over me, and I struggled mightily to overcome my deficiencies, but I couldn't. I was one of those contestants on American Idol who believed his passion was enough to ensure his success. One day, I brought home a sconce I had made in wood shop. It looked like a paramecium. After a heavy sigh, my granddad gave me the best advice I've ever received. He told me, Mike, you can still be a tradesman, but only if you get yourself a different kind of toolbox. At the time, this felt contrary to everything I believed about the importance of passion and persistence and staying the course. But of course he was right, because Staying the course, that only makes sense if you're headed in a sensible direction. And while passion is way too important to be without, it is way too fickle to follow around. Which brings us to the final dirty truth. Never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Congratulations again, and good luck. I'm Mike Rowe from MicroWorks for Prager University. So now, is everybody here in the same, is this, this, this the IT group? Yes. So everybody here is in uh, infrastructure training and that kind of networking and help desk and all. So congratulations, you guys picked a great field. There's definitely lots of opportunity. Uh, so it's, it's a field that has a, a great shortage. The pay is, is in good, uh, is a good. I will say often they always talk about the end pay. Uh, the thing is the first job may be more disappointing than you think because the education as a part of it, uh, then, then you have to actually get the skills. After your first few jobs, I would tell like computer programmers who get a bachelor's degree is often the pay usually starts about the same $45,000, $50,000 that a nurse or other professionals would get. The difference is how quickly it goes up. The difference is once you gain those skills that, you know, a nurse or somebody might get 3% annual over, but, uh, you know, I have people who are getting 10, 20, 30% uh, or, or year over year, depending on how how much they take advantage of the skills and whatnot. So, congratulations, good choice. So, um, I would say, no, don't guess. You, you had mentioned about knowing exactly. You're absolutely right, so I got a great story. So my wife and I met, uh, she was a vet tech, so I brought my cat in to get, a, get checked out. Cute little vet tech, worked out. Asked her on a date, we got together. So she was still in school, I'm a little bit older, and um, uh, she's, she's going through school, she likes the medical field, she likes being a vet tech, and we said, okay, but it's time to pick a degree. And she's a nurse, or doc. she wanted to be a veterinarian, but she, I will say we're emotionally codependent, I own a business, I couldn't leave, and she didn't want to be gone for a few years, so, so that was out. And she said, well, I like the lab work. 
I enjoy doing the lab work. I enjoy checking, you know, the, the specimens and diagnosing things and going it. So they have a clinical laboratory sciences degree at West Florida, and she went through it and, and finished it and got into the hospital. And that's the first time she learned that you do absolutely no diagnosing whatsoever. It's always a doctor. You basically run the test. A monkey could do it. It's kind of sad because they train you, you know, what levels mean what. And to this day, if she, she keeps current, even though she works for me, she's been working for me for eight years, just quality of life, we want to be together. Um, she still keeps her, her license up. And if you bring her lab work, you say, oh, your A1C, you need to cut your sugar, you know, this, oh, this could be an indication of blah, 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 blah. They never did that in the hospital. She didn't really know the job. So, uh, like again, you guys may be a little too far along, but I definitely encourage job shadowing, getting together with somebody um, uh, to really find out what is the job and ask them, what is the best thing about this job? And ask them, what is the worst thing about this job? I guarantee you, greatest rock star you ever know on occasion says, damn it, I gotta go on stage tonight. I'm tired, I don't wanna do it. There is no job, no matter how much you love it, that doesn't have some crap that you gotta put up with. Find out what that crap is and make sure you can put up with it. So, no, don't guess, uh, do some research. So, now we're talking about getting the job. It's probably what you guys are most interested in, so let's get to it. So, getting the job. So, I got some bad news for you. I'm sorry to tell you, but your education is a checkbox. Anybody applying for the job has the same thing. It does not differentiate. Of course it's important. You have to have it. You wouldn't even be there if you don't. But everybody else has it as well, or they wouldn't be there. Some level of experience or some education that makes you qualified to apply for that job. So you need to put it on your resume, you need to talk about it, but I wouldn't harp on it. This is not gonna be the differentiator that gets you the job. So what are those differentiators? And that's soft skills and extracurricular activities. So how you hold yourself, how you communicate, the level of confidence you have is what's being gauged in an interview. So I have a common question that I ask people in the tech field. I ask them what kind of computer they have at home. Hey, what kind of computer do you have at home? Do I really care what kind of computer you have at home? I could care less what kind of computer I have at home. I want to hear how you talk about that computer. You know, I got an 8088. I'm being ridiculous, of course. You don't even know what that is. And uh, I was too young to, to have an 8088. <laughs> you know, I built it myself and it has, you know, X gig and storage and RAM and you know, I use it for this and use it for that. And what I'm, I'm gauging the passion and whatnot that you have. And that a lot of questions you're gonna be asked, they, they, they really are probably looking for something else. They're looking to gauge some other thing. I mean, so some questions are pretty direct. What education you have? Okay, great. But a question like that about what you do. How you hold yourself. Come prepared for an interview. Don't have misspellings on your resume. Dress appropriately. So we have a very relaxed culture at our place and occasionally somebody hey I'm over here or something I said don't worry about how you dress and then I, I'm not worried about how they dress but if I didn't say that to them and they show up really casual I'm like you're not taking it very seriously and like you might look around and say well everybody's casual good I fit in no you didn't because you weren't there for the same reason so I'm not saying a three-piece suit every time you go but definitely look professional be professional uh, you know, look people in the eye, give them the handshake, look like you're not afraid to be there. When interviewing, especially when it's entry level, the power dynamics are pretty skewed towards the person who has the job. But remember, it is a negotiation that's a two-way street. You want that job, but they want somebody to fill that job, right? You have something to sell as well. So I would recommend also making sure you ask a few questions. Ask them about the location, ask it. Show that you have real interest. Um, I always say it's a good tip for the guys too, sorry. We, we make sure on a first date, the girl is doing 75% of the talking, right? <laughs> and you're listening, uh, that, that's a big win. I think it works the same in interview. Let them do about 75% of the questions, but don't just say nothing, ask nothing. You know, ask about, there's nothing wrong with asking about pay either. And I've seen people who get upset. I, I saw one situation where another company got upset, they asked about pay, I'm like, what a stupid thing to do. What are you gonna do, do it for free? You're just gonna accept the job without knowing? Understanding what you're gonna get paid is not, a, a, it should not be a bad question. I don't know that I'd make it the first question. <laughs> uh, asking about the environment and career opportunities, whatever's important to you about the job. Um, so the other one is extracurricular activities. This is what's gonna set you apart. Um, I love 
the UWF Code Fest that they have for software engineers. I almost exclusively in the last five years have picked up the interns, my, I call them interns, but usually it's entry level position, not, a, not truly an intern, uh, recent graduate. Every single one I've hired in the last five years has been somebody who went to CodeFest. CodeFest is just a weekend long programming thing and you don't get anything for it. You win, you get a prize, so you get some bragging rights. You basically check in on a Friday and you have till Sunday and people go without sleep, they work through the night, uh, you know, you're just all in there. The innovative ideas and whatnot are fantastic, but I am telling you, that's a person who gave up their whole weekend and has passion for what they do. They also got to do a real life, yes, it's two days, it's not exactly a huge amount of experience, but they got real life experience of what it takes to do this. You know, in class you're learning a lot of theory, how much hands-on work. Hey, here's a firewall, configure it, good luck, <laughs> no book, no assignment, you know, oh, it's broken. That's, I always joke with the software engineers, that people don't come to me with software specs, they come to me with problems. We have to design. They think technology is going to solve the problem, that's about as close as it gets. Then we have to design the solutions. There isn't a sample in the book or previously done theory that you're getting from school. So definitely extracurricular activities. Now, the CodeFest, of course, is great for programmers. It's really tough for infrastructure engineers. We are a member of the SHU Foundation, and I have asked that we do something collectively. The problem is you guys need the gear, which is expensive. So having a code fest for uh, a code fest type thing for infrastructure engineers, we may be having an attacking team and a defending team. You got some firewalls and a network and you know one team's defending it, one's attacking it, but you gotta have all that gear and it's expensive. And so, but I would love to do that and, and, and have some kind of competition for you guys. Minus that, what can you do? What can you do for free? What can, you know, do you have your church or your hobby? Uh, you know, your band, you know, create a website, do something, find a way uh, to put your skills to use for somebody, you know, give it to a nonprofit or some, some, something you're passionate about, try to help them out, get something on your resume and get somebody um, to, to give you a little uh, uh, extra so you can put something on your resume besides the education. Again, education is fantastic, it's necessary, but it's a checkbox. Probably the second most important thing I'm going to say about getting a job, so I'm going to tell you the most important thing, the one nugget you absolutely have to get, easiest way to get a job, it's who you know. It's who you know. You're like, damn it, I can't believe he said that. I don't know anybody. I just moved here. You know, my, person, my mom's uh, from Spain. She's sixth grade education. You know, she's a seamstress. You know, we didn't know anybody. We didn't have a political clout. We were lucky to eat some nights, you know. And uh, so I didn't know anybody. But it's not that complicated. So this story is from this week. On Saturday, I went out to Baytown Wharf to accept an award from Middle Coast Magazine for a company, and I happened to wear my Bitwizard shirt. Afterwards, I went grocery shopping because my wife was on a girls' weekend, so I had all the shopping and cooking and stuff. And uh, I happened to, I was checking out, and uh, the checkout girl uh, said, oh, you, you work at Bitwizard, what do you do? I said, well, I, I own it, you know, I'm, I'm a software engineer. She says, oh, that's awesome. I'm, I'm at uh, uh, Florida State University, she's doing online school, uh, getting a degree in computer science, and I graduate in December. I'm like, oh, really? That's awesome, that's fantastic. You know, we, we have an opening for an intern. I say intern, I use the wrong, the wrong, the word appropriately. I've already said it once, I won't say it again. I usually mean entry level position. So, so I shot her my email, just hand it to her, and well, she sent me a wonderfully worded email with a great cover letter specific to our situation and a very clean resume that has nothing on it, okay? But it's very clean, it's very professional. She's, she has her education and that she works at Publix. I mean, there's nothing on the resume, but I, the format of the resume, the, 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 the professionalism with which it was delivered. So um, I forwarded it on to the HR person, the director of software engineering, and say, hey, I, I met this young lady. She seemed very professional, uh, uh, very articulate. Uh, maybe we should just give her a, an interview. And that's the thing about getting that personal connection, is that personal connection just bumps you one level up. You're almost guaranteed to get a phone call or an interview, whereas if you just send your resume in, it's like, okay, maybe, I don't know, uh, trash, you know. Um, and that just, that assumes we're looking. Uh, one assumption I had with when I sent my resume is they were looking. If you're not looking, the resumes collect dust. Even our company, we got 50 something people, it's still a tiny company. If we're not hiring, I'm not looking at resumes, they come in, I don't pay any attention, I got other things to do. Um, so, 
If you don't know somebody, you guys have huge numbers of tools. Use LinkedIn. Do some research about the company and find the people in there. Find somebody, and by the way, it doesn't matter who, find somebody you know that knows somebody there to send your resume to that person. That is, you just went up in value like 30, 50 percent. Uh, you're going to get the phone call, you're going to get the resume. Um, and with all the tools you have out there, it's, it's not hard to find out somebody who knows somebody. So the other one is be prepared. Be prepared. Anybody know why this symbol? Anybody understand why that image matches? What's that? I'm just curious. Anybody know why the picture matches the thing? The Hunger Games? Oh, okay. I guess that, I, I, I forgot, I thought about it. It's the Boy Scout salute. It's the old Boy Scout salute. And the motto is be prepared, right? The Boy Scout motto is be prepared. So be prepared. Be prepared. There's a lot of strategies for finding a job. One is the shotgun method where you send your resume out to a bunch of different places. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? You're just like, bam, 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 bam. But there's probably, if you guys have done, you, there's probably a handful of jobs at least that you guys, so maybe if you live here and you say, man, Bitwiz is pretty awesome, they're 12 time best places to work, I wanna go there. So maybe you don't do the shotgun approach for Bitwiz units. Um, you say, well, maybe I should find out what, who are they, what do they do, let me read some of the bios, let me uh, you know, do my research, be prepared when you get into that interview. And find a way, you'll find a way, there'll be an opportunity. Like, oh, we do this, oh yeah, I read about that on your website. Yeah, that's shameless plugging that you did some homework. <laughs> Nothing wrong with showing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, so on our website, we sell expertise. So every single member of our team actually has a bio on the website, a little fun video. That, you know, they're, they're kind of funny, quirky ones. And definitely, if you know who you're going to meet with, you should go see if they say something about that. Check that person out on LinkedIn. If you find out you have something in common. Oh, I go to that same church. Oh, I saw you love cats. You know, I have a cat. Um, so I have five cats, just so you know. My wife and I agreed to three. We have five, so you, you know who's in charge in that relationship. So be prepared, do your homework, at least for the jobs you care about. I, you know, I, I do understand the shotgun method. There's nothing wrong with that, especially when you're talking about long distances. You can you know, just shoot your resume out to 100 places. You can't necessarily spend the time to research 100 different places. If you get the interview, though, and you're interested, I would definitely do your homework then. So. Everything I went through is not exhaustive. I just wanted, again, I wanted to kind of change the way you're thinking. Think, think about it. So many people come and tell me about the classes they took. I know what classes you take. I, uh, I will say the OTC program is new to me. I did not know about this one. And so I haven't done any research but, uh, on what you guys do. But I will. Eventually, when you start coming to me, I'm going to be finding out what, what you guys have done. I know, the, I know all the UWF programs. Uh, I know the computer science versus the computer engineering versus the software engineering program, which classes they take, what they do, you know, and the things like that. So it really isn't that impressive. I think you need to talk about those uh, extra things. But once you have the job, I have two employees who've been with me, my first employee has been with me 18 years, and somebody else who's been with me a really long time. And that first employee, uh, we, I think we paid him 25000 a year. I could barely afford it. I mean, he was the first employee. We were just struggling company. I don't even know why he took the money because the guy was really smart. Over the next uh, three years, I think he went from 25000 to 75000 in three years. Hired a different person, a little bit higher because we could afford a little bit more, you know, pr probably a better starting wage, 45000 And in three years, he was making about fifty-five, sixty thousand. 60000 So... It is what you know. I mean, I, I do talk about the rate at which you go up in this field, but it is based on your skills. This is very much a merit-based technical field. The, the, you know, the more you can do, the better you are. And I would not just harp on your technical skill. Your soft skills with dealing with business, especially at a company like Bitwizards. In, in IT, you, you're going to be dealing with people. Your transactional problems, if you can help us. Sure, maybe you're taking care of a database and you never have to see the end user, but you're still going to be dealing with other people that use that database that you're maintaining. And more than likely you're dealing with you know, network assets, help desk, you're dealing with people on a transactional basis. Um, you want to make sure you keep those skills honed too um, and, and doing it. So anyways, let's talk about excelling in your career. So number one, ownership thinking. So ownership thinking isn't about owning the company. It's about owning the task. So when, when I grew up on Hollywood Boulevard, 
And my mom has a, like a half acre yard. It has three big magnolias in the back and an oak in the front. And so my brother and my sister and I would all equally complain and bitch about getting out and taking care of that yard. But inevitably, my mom would always ask me a little bit more often than my brother and sister. Because even, God, I hate this stupid freaking yard. These magnolia leaves are terrible. The thing is, there was something in me that could not leave a leaf behind or a row unmowed. It's, it didn't matter what I did. Everything I did, I had to do it right. Now, it might be a little OCD. <laughs> but if you don't have that built in, figure out how to do it. Do everything with everything you've got. Do the best job you can. Uh, uh, we have another, ownership thinking is one of our core values at Bitwishers. We have another one called Be the Magic, which is the extra. Don't just do what you're asked to do. Do more. They say, I, I, need, I need a spreadsheet for the, the list of salaries. And then I get the start dates and the, 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 the raise history or something from my HR person. She's like, okay, yeah, you, you asked for this information. Here's additional in case you need it kind of thing. And here's the thing about that, is that the truth is self-evident. Everything you do isn't going to be noticed. If you're working late at night, they may, not, they may not notice. They may not realize or even say thank you sometimes when you put in the extra. Don't look for instant gratification for every single thing you do. You make it part of you that you're an ownership thinker, that you're going to do the best job you can. I've got to be here 8, 10 hours anyways. Just put my mind, be present in this job, do the best job I can, work with my team the best I can. And if you do that all the time, the truth is self-evident. There's no way it goes unnoticed. The individual things may be missed, but the big picture will not be missed. You will be set apart. You'll be like, hey, we can count on that person. That person, you know, when it's time for promotion, when it's time for raises, the truth will be self-evident. The truth is self-evident and sometimes people don't appreciate it. A little caveat. At BitWizards, this does not happen. We proactively do raises, we proactively look, we, make, we have systems and processes to make sure things don't fall through the gaps. But I have seen it. I've seen others who, it's like, uh, uh, the, the, my director of software engineering used to work for a company where they kept promising, he was an ownership thinker, doing a great job, and they kept promising him, and, yeah, a little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later, and basically they're stringing him along. I would say the truth is self-evident, but you may be in a place that doesn't appreciate it. I think those are more rare. Uh, I wouldn't, the first time you get passed over, I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, just jump to that conclusion. Uh, but when you kind of realize you're at a dead end, just find a new job. Trust me, in the skill set you guys are in, the first job is going to be the hardest job for you to get. Try to stay there at least two years and put something on your resume. After that, you're going to write your ticket. There's such a shortage. You're not going to have any problems. I don't even care if you suck at this job. I hate to say it, but you're still going to get jobs. <laughs> so, all right. Now, uh, your best teacher is your last mistake. This is, this is pretty common knowledge that a lot of people have. You know, every failure, what is it? That, I forget the failing is a learning opportunity or something. I forget the acronym and whatnot. But here's the thing, there's actually a process to doing this. And you need to objectively learn from every failure. Objectively learn from every failure. So there are two extremes here. There's the one person that's like, I am terrible. I'm so stupid, I suck. Everything is my fault. That is not objective, that is not corrective. What thing did you do? What, maybe it is the lack of confidence. Maybe it is the fact that you're self-loathing or something, right? Okay, but you, could, you gotta identify that. Uh, I, I didn't get that promotion because I'm too meek, okay? That's a specific, and now you can work on it. You're gonna learn from your mistakes. You've gotta actually identify what is the mistake. Um, you've got the other extreme. It's always somebody else's fault. I'm going to get a little political. I'm, I'm actually not going to get political. I'm going to say this is going to sound political, but it is not. Okay? Today's identity politics, many of you probably have differing views from racism, misogyny, and everything is everywhere, every day. You got another crowd that says, like, it doesn't occur at all. Obviously, it does. And whatever you believe is what you believe in this presentation of truth. But if you always go to that extreme and don't ask, what could I have done better, you're never going to improve. And so even if it's true, it's not like somebody's going to tell you, I'm not hiring you because you're a woman. They're not going to tell you that, right? They're not going to hire you. But you, can, you could ask yourself, you, you know, I know that other person, and I know I'm better, I have more skills, 
Um, I asked for less money. I don't know, you maybe know these things or something. You know, why would they do that? Well, it could, very well could be because they're misogynist. It could be. But maybe it's because they know that person. Maybe it's somebody's nephew or something, right? Or maybe there was a misspelling on your resume and you didn't even get a chance because they're like, if she makes a mistake here, what are the mistakes you're gonna make, right? So you have no chance to look at what you're doing. And that's what I'm talking about, objectively learning from every failure. You gotta look at it. Is it possible that this, could I have done better that? So twice, we almost went out of business. Once was after 9-11, it was just my partner and I, and the only reason we made it is because we weren't married. I made $1,500 for the whole year. My, my social security statements for, for one year. I sold a house in Austin, that's how I survived, or I, would, I wouldn't have made it. Um, I made 1500 the whole year. The second mistake was a combination of things that happened in 2014, including expand, blowing my reserve capital on moving to a new building that we're in now, we're about to move again. And there were some other reasons, it's a long story, that's not important. Um, but moving into that building, I realized, you know, it was painful and we almost didn't make it. And I borrowed three quarters of a million dollars from one step down from Benny the Loan Shark. This was like leased money that they pulled directly from your account at 30% interest. And I said, well, you can go bankrupt for two million bucks as easily as one. So we just rolled the dice and we won and we won. So we came back stronger and better than ever. So fantastic. But I tell you, I think I suffered PTSD for two years struggling to get out of that. But obviously I re-examined almost every decision and one of them was going into the building. And I, I, going into the building really hurt because we, we it just increased all of our expenses right at the time we had a downturn. But I looked at it, I looked at the growth. We had six months to prep the building. I looked at the time when we signed the lease versus the time we moved in. And there was nobody in their right mind would have thought that it was a bad idea. And I do not, yes, in hindsight, it was a bad decision. But in the moment that I made the decision, all the data points, and trust me, I beat myself up about this. I said, no, that was a good decision. Nobody would have made a different decision. Uh, one of the reasons we were going under was we actually grew a little too fast, and we didn't have systems and processes in place to handle that, so we had some messed up work. And so expanding the building because of that growth was a fantastic decision. The, the fallout came later. So, yeah, objectively learn from your, your failures. And you never arrive. You never arrive. So, you know, you're 14 years old, so when I'm 16 and I got my license, I'll be free. And when I'm 18 and I'm an adult, out of high school, everything's gonna be better. When I graduate college, when I get the first job, when I get married, when I have kids, when I retire, when I die, okay? You never arrive. Life is just a series of new challenges. Uh, listen, I, I, you know, I had a pretty rough childhood. Uh, my, my dad's an evil, a lot of people have bad dads. My dad's an evil criminal. Uh, he's just a terrible, terrible person. And my mom, you know, sixth grade education, Spanish lady. She, I love my mom, respect my mom. She's the toughest nails lady, but uh, she was really tough. And so we had a series of problems there, you know, that, that I dealt with. I don't have those problems anymore. I'm financially well off and, and in good shape. But now I have the, the well-being of, of this, this, I never had children of my own. I have three grown daughters and eight grandchildren that I take care of. I have 50-something people whose livelihoods depend on the decisions I make. It's a new set of problems. And some of them are quite, you know, might seem really large, but the thing is I've, I built up to handle those problems. I mean, I've, I'm experienced enough to handle those problems. You'll be the same way. You just have new challenges. And isn't that great? I mean, I think it's fantastic. Otherwise, just, what are you doing, waiting to die? So, I, not only, I don't think you should ever think you arrive. You should always be, always be thinking about what's next, what's next, what's next. And so, you know, basically it's just, this is just basic life advice. It's very simple and it's absolutely true. Learn from the past, don't live in it. Uh, plan or think for the future, right? Always facing a new challenge but live in the moment, live in the moment. Enjoy your life, we get a finite number of years, have a good time with it, make sure you have balance. I mean, most of you are probably in your 20s, early 20s, a little, little bit, a couple of you guys a little bit older. And uh, you know, in the 20s, I think career is probably the focus, that's what I did, I worked my butt off um, to get good at what I do. In my 30s, I focused more on, on building my business, but also my wife and my family. And now I'm actually uh, focused on, I'm a big, huge proponent of lifelong learning. So I'm always doing something. I'm trying to learn to speak Spanish. I'm other Spanish, you know. And uh, I've been sailing. I took some sailing classes and doing other things. So it's more leisure type of things. I'm getting older, so. But new challenges. Anyways, 
that's what I have prepared. So happy to answer any questions. Anything from anybody? Yes, yes. Um, so do you offer internships at um, I don't have a formal internship program with anybody except UWF who actually hasn't taken advantage of it. So um, I do hire people who haven't finished school, but uh, an internship in the, in the proper term means it's a negotiation with the school that you would get class credit for. I have some obligations about what we would teach you. You know, I can't just make you fetch coffee uh, kind of thing. And then, uh, and then the school gives you some time or something. I, I forget all that works. I don't know that OTC does that or not. I will say we do hire, um, and especially in the managed IT group, we have actually hired three people in the last year who just had some basic skills. And what we do is we put them on our ops help desk, and then and as they have technical skill that we feel sufficient, we move them into the, um, into, um, uh, the thing. So I'd have to, Sam Blows is the director of, of the managed IT team. So he would be somebody that you'd want to check out on the website if you were gonna go have an interview, because he's gonna end up making the decision. I don't force, I basically retain veto power, like, but I don't force the directors, who they hire and fire who they want. Uh, because I, I expect them to run the departments, I wanna hold them accountable, so I let them have the freedom to make their choices. So Sam is the person who does that. And um, um, that was a long answer. The answer is no, we don't have a formal internship, but yes, we do hire entry level or people who are still in school. Okay. So, okay. yes. I have one other question. Yeah. So I am interested in like, videography and design. Oh yeah, yeah. Eventually, that, so the digital marketing group is a little bit smaller. I gotta tell you, we've got, we have a fantastic videographer. He used to work for the Golf Channel. He's doing amazing work. So it would be awesome, you know, if he needed help to have, because learning from him would be fantastic. The guy is amazing. We've had a few, and I've had some good ones, but I tell you, this guy is on a whole new level. Um, uh, Michael Harrison is his name. Yeah, he's, the, he's our videographer at BitWizards. The digital marketing team has been expanded. Uh, I have a new director of digital marketing, Heather Ruiz. She's actually the, the Fulton Beach Chamber Chair this year. And uh, strategically, she is fantastic as well. I'm really lucky. And that, that group is growing. But right now, it's still pretty small. I don't think there's any open positions. But Heather Ruiz runs that department. Michael Harrison is the, is the videographer we currently have. So we are looking for a graphic designer, I think. Um, I think we're still looking for a graphic designer. So you, you mentioned that too, right? Yeah. So that's another nice thing. If you can get in one way and work to another, that, that didn't really give that, but I've done that in the past where uh, with the MITS people, they actually sit on the ops desk, so the job is really answering the phone. So it's setting prioritization, but they're using our tools. Autotask is a ticket management tool. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or, or whatnot. Um, that's the ticket management tool we use. Ninja RMM for the remote management. Um, I don't know what you guys teach or or what tools they have for that kind of thing. Um, we use Ninja, RMM, Autotask for the PSA, um, Cloudberry for desktop backup. We use Azure services for server backups. Um, I'm not sure the virus stuff that we do. So BitWizards does managed IT. We, uh, companies employ us and we don't do break fix. So what we do is we bring them to a standard set of technologies that we're comfortable with. So Office 365, Fortinet firewall. We'll make some exceptions on firewall if they already have one. It's a pretty expensive piece of equipment. Um, we use uh, Ubiquity APs and other things. And then we standardize the tool set. And what that does, it allows us to keep the cost down because we have a standard set of technology to handle all of our clients. And we have clients all over the country. I mean, Lodi, California, New York, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're using a lot of third party tools. And so you're absolutely right. They become vulnerable. Uh, we do that. You know, with, and by the way, I will say, I used to say, uh, when we were just a custom software shop, I said we do the hardest thing in IT in the hardest possible way. Do project-based custom software engineering in a co-located facility. And then I started working with managed IT. I'm like, nope, this is much harder. <laughs> and Because uh, one thing is when people call me and people want software, they're at least excited or they're bland about the fact that we're gonna build something new, right? So they're like, okay, we're gonna get a new tool, fantastic. Or some people are like, I don't care, the old tool's fine, but whatever. But when people call for you guys, you're like, something's broken. So it's like, rah, 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 rah. and they somehow associate you with that problem, right? What'd you do? That's, this is how uh, I got my first computer. It was a 386, and I read the DOS book cover to cover. And I was making lists and you know, commands and batch files and whatever. 
And then uh, I start, you know, my friends had computers, so they'd call me over to help them out. And then it was that time when, I don't know, I fixed a hard drive or something, and then they called me up, hey, my printer's not working. What'd you do to my computer? <laughs> yeah, that was the end of my, my IT days. That's, that's where I said, I ain't doing this crap. I'm not responsible, you know. I didn't do anything to you. Well, when you touch it, just stop working. So um, we are, of course, the people that they pay to work through those problems. Every business today is an IT company. We work for vet offices, doctor's offices, steel mills, uh, optics, uh, a, a chain of 15 eyeglass stores in New York. Um, um, I mean, this is, the list goes on. Uh, a regional planning council, Emerald Coast Marine. Uh, every business has IT assets, but you didn't get into, people didn't get into business, unless you're in our business, <laughs> you can get into business to handle IT assets. Uh, so it's pain in the butt. Well, I always have to remind people, we're the people you pay to solve these problems that we're used to in our daily lives. I mean, every personal life is filled with technology. You know, I mean, it's hard to find grandma who doesn't use Facebook or something, right? Um, so, yeah, we have to deal with those things, educate our customers, protect them where we can. Uh, we do, uh, there's no 100% protection either. I mean, so we do defense in depth. So we've got the firewall, okay. We've got the antivirus, okay. But if it all goes to hell, I mean, here's the thing. If you walk them in with ransomware, oh, let me see this USB drive, bam, let me launch that sucker. Nothing I can do about that. So then we have the backups. Okay, now we can wipe the network and bring it all back. So, um, you know, the fact that some of the tools got hacked, I think Kaseya, was that where you guys were studying? Uh, no, Office 365. Oh, Office 365, yeah, yeah. And I think Azure. Oh, I hadn't heard about the Azure one, which I'm surprised, because we're a huge Azure shop. Huh. And uh, my other company, uh, too, Talking Parents. Um, so I have another company called Talking Parents. The software is a service application that helps in co-parenting. So it organizes the communication and schedule for people who you know, are raising children not together. Also keeps a permanent unchangeable record. If the fighting happens, you can take it to court. And uh, it's all in Azure. So, yes ma'am. Are you only located here? Only, uh, so I have some remote software engineers that work in other, but they don't have, we don't have offices. I have sales offices in other cities. So we're actually shutting that down more and more. We, we yeah, uh, so we had offices in Texas. Tennessee, Georgia, um, but they were sales offices. Basically, I had a salesperson. Atlanta, we had one in Atlanta, yep. So we did the Regis office thing where you didn't actually, you know, the rental office space for conference rooms and whatnot, and I have a salesperson so they could meet there. We could fly up if we had a big deal or something that we were talking to somebody and, and it looked much more professional. <laughs> but no, we, uh, the engineering staff we like to keep together. So the engineering staff is here. We've had to go remote, which I don't love, um, just, you know, it is tougher to, to find people in this area. Um, I, it's easier for me to get middle-aged families, you know, fam families with like eight to 10 year old kids from the north that say they're tired of the cold and they come down here, than it is to get the younger people who are like, I wanna be in the big city, you know? So, uh, on the software engineering side, yeah. So rather than to say I did this in school or something, I don't, you know, the thing is, it, it may be unkind or, and unfair of me and people like me to hear that and kind of be a bit dismissive. Um, so I think it's better if you tell a story, like we're talking about things, just, you know, they're gonna ask you questions. Gonna, What's your experience with servers? And you've done something. So actually, you know, I did blah, 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 blah. Or do you have an experience with the cloud? Well, you know, and, and that, it could be in school or it could be out of school and find something you say, well, we did this and we, we did that. Oh, oh, but by the way, be careful with the we's too. So I'm always listening to those. We did this and we did that. And you might have been in a group. And so, um, so it isn't bad to share, it shows you a team player. said, we did this and I was responsible for this. Uh, I think it's better, because when you say we, 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 I start wondering, were you the one who was doing it or are you the one sitting back getting credit? <laughs> so I think telling stories. So the things that you've done in class, you can tell them, oh, uh, yeah, we actually tore apart an AP and put it back together. And, you know, I, I learned blah, blah, blah. And I'm sorry, by the way, I'm not even an infrastructure guy. I'm a software engineer. So it's hard for me to talk about your field. So, uh, you know, we configured a, uh, oh, firewalls. Uh, yeah, I was actually part of a group that uh, configured a firewall for safety uh, or uh, for security. We were, uh, I don't know how you guys run the class, but maybe, like I said, have a positive and minus group, right? So we were responsible for securing it, and then another group tried to hack in, and they were unsuccessful, so that was awesome. Or they were, it's okay. Yeah, they were able to get in, but we learned how to pu plug that port or this or that and the other. 
So I think telling stories is the best way to do that. Uh, when, when the topic comes up in the interview as they're talking to you about your skill set, tell them what you actually did it sounds better than, and, and that's going to be nice for skill base because you can't tell a story about taking a test. <laughs> yeah, I took a test on object-oriented programming. It was awesome. <laughs> I got a 90. <laughs> Uh, you know, anything helps. Uh, depends. I, will, I would say bring it to the interview. Don't bring it early. Uh, so, uh, um, summarize your skills, by the way. Once you have, as in the beginning, you might have, summarize your skills at the top. A lot of times, have, the problem is going through resumes takes time. And so often you have non-skilled people doing it or we're, or we're really flipping. We don't read it. We're scanning them. So read it to be scanned then read, right? This is why most resumes actually have the bullet point technology sets and then you have like highlighted, bolded, you know, job here, dates, job here, dates, and then more fine print about the detail because that's exactly what's going to be read. The first time it's like, do they have what I'm looking for? Okay, I see. But that, that's good. Okay, a little deeper. Okay, how long have they been doing this? Okay, some jobs. Okay, that's good. Ooh, that's interesting. They worked at that company. I know that company. And then, okay, I'll read that one. And that's how your resume is going to get read. <coughs> to actually read it from beginning to end, I, I mean, I know there's a C type person out there who does that. It, that's, that's the unicorn. Most people do not read them beginning to end. Uh, they're looking for them. And, that's prob and, and it shows in the format that they're in, um, that, that kind of outline format, uh, because that's how they get read. So portfolio, yes. I think, I think when you add additional stuff, um, it's a balancing between where you are as to overdo the information. I hate a 10-page resume. I'm like, what the hell? And especially if it's not formatted, it's hard to read. I mean, I might throw it in the trash if I'm busy. Um, I will say, I, I joke, I, I said I hired everybody there, but the truth is now the middle management layer for the last two years or so is really doing most of the hiring. I'm still involved. Uh, I still do kind of a final interview at some, uh, for some of these positions and whatnot, but we are getting bigger, so it's being uh, uh, delegated down. But now, of course, now you have three new people at BitWizards, and what, what do they look for, right? Each one's a little bit different, so. Um, so when you were talking about like, making the connections with people, where would you say is like, the best place to do that? So it, it, it just take research, right? So if BitWizards, if, if BitWizards is a company that you wanted to work for, um, you say, well, I met that guy, Lewis. You know, you met me here. It could be two years from now, right? But that's a great place to, you know, okay, let me, he should be on the website, but hopefully you remember my name or maybe you have to look it up or something. Or maybe you go back to the website and look through my pictures. Oh, I, that's the guy. And so then I would send like a personal email to me. It's not that hard to get a hold of me. I'm, I, I'm, you know, most people in business are not that hard. Uh, we, we want people to reach us, right? I'm not hidden. So you can say, hey, I was in that OTC um, class that you, you presented. Uh, I'm looking for a job now. Uh, my resume is attached. Uh, are you guys looking for anything? And I, I guarantee you that that I'm like, oh yeah, I was I was there. You know, I, so well the thing is that we already have that personal connection. I don't even know your name, but I'm going to remember that I was here. And that personal connection is all it takes, just that little bit. And now I'll say, hey, Mallory, I'll give it to the HR person. Mallory, this is somebody that was at uh, the OTC thing. Could you go ahead and forward him to Sam? He's looking for a job. And so, okay, now it's going to be forwarded from Mallory instead of just randomly showing up in Sam's box. So he's going to read it. I don't know, it's not going to necessarily get you the job. Do we have the job? Is there competitors? I mean, it's not, but it just got you that much closer than sending it in to the generic mail position where it goes into our bamboo system where it may or may not be looked at depending on wh what we're doing or what's important to us. So that's just one path. But say you don't know anything. You just, you, you, it's a company. Well, go, go read about the company. Usually there'll be something about the people that work there. Um, you can go on LinkedIn and look up people who work at a company that are listed. Not, not everybody does that, but you could find uh, something and, and, and do a little bit of research. Uh, if it's close by, go ask. Walk into the, um, uh, the reception lobby and ask a little bit of the company. You can just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm graduating soon and I really heard great things about this company and you know, I, I was just driving by. I'd, I'd make it real minimal. I was just driving by and I, I didn't mean to talk to anybody, but you could talk to the receptionist. What, what do you like about this company or something? And, she, and most people, they give you a little bit of time. Um, oh yeah, it's a great place. We have three divisions. Oh really, okay. And so I'm in, I'm in managed IT. Yes, Sam runs that division. Bam, you have a contact, right? And then you could say, Tiana, that's our receptionist, Tiana, let me know about you, and you send your resume. 
it's, it's almost like you've picked out the personal connection with Tiana, which is not tr untrue. You did talk to Tiana. Tiana did tell you about it. Bam, your resume just went to the top. So it's not that hard. It really isn't that hard. And it is the thing that will get you the most bang for your buck. If you can get somebody to get your resume to, to the person that needs to get to in the company, just by saying, Tiana mentioned that you were in charge of hiring and I'm looking for a job. Bam, he's going to read your resume because Tiana's name was mentioned in there. <laughs> so we all kind of, sometimes we have a little deference to people we think are more advanced than us in some way, career-wise or education-wise or something like that. So I met with Kevin Harrington like a month ago. So Kevin Harrington is the Ginsu knife guy. So he's a billionaire. He was the original shark on Shark Tank. And so he's getting into business with another guy, his kind of go-to driver, that is talking to me about some software development. And, and so he was coming down to pump everybody up about it and whatnot. And so we just sitting there BSing and he just told a story. And I could go through the story, but the point being, it was like, he's just a guy. He's just a guy who just made a few good choices and bam, he's got a billion dollars, right? But uh, th there's nothing special about it. I mean, there are jerks in the world who don't want to give you time and, and have a little bit of arrogance and whatnot. It, it's going to happen. But there's also just a bunch of people who are like, hey, whatever, I got lucky. I'm happy to help you guys get lucky, right? And in part, I, I, I tell you, I learned the failures. I had plenty of those. So <laughs> nobody's cost Bitwizards more money than me. <laughs> uh, you know, I had the two successful businesses, but I didn't mention the five that, that tanked, you know, the tailgater carrier and the blunt block. Yes, sir. <coughs> So I was really poor. Um, I, I mean, we, we had trouble eating sometimes, and um, um, I didn't like it. I, I was very money driven. I went to school and asked myself, what, what can I make money at? I was actually getting a degree in math and physics. What am I good at, too? Because I considered doctor, but I, I, don't, I don't like the blood and guts and all that mess. So, um, so I was doing that. I happened to take a computer course, and I was, I was like a guy. At, you know, I was one of the A students in physics. And went out, but I was the guy in programming. I mean, um, and so I said, okay, good, I'm really good at this. So, because being good at it is gonna help with the, with the driving force. And so I was very driven, um, and, and I, <laughs> it's actually probably a second, it's a long, I should go sit on a couch somewhere and talk about this, but I was very driven. So it was like one thing after, you know, I, I, it wasn't when I was a kid, I, I didn't finish high school. Uh, I was a bad kid, I was into drugs and other things, and, um, uh, but I was only stoned to riding a motorcycle in physics class. <laughs> so I, I'm lucky I was book smart. Um, so, but there was a day, I remember the day at 19, I said, I don't wanna live this way anymore. And I changed, I just, overnight, I decided, I didn't get it right, right away, but I started on this path. I had to go to the Navy to get the funding to go to school. I didn't finish high school, so I wasn't getting any scholarships or anything. I had to do it the hard way. And I ended up being 26 when I graduated, and I got my first job. I worked for McDonnell Douglas in Saudi Arabia. Then I, I worked for BTG, building software in C++. And even then, I started talking about my business right then with my best friend. Unfortunately, my sister passed away, and I, I inherited her son. So he was 14, and I got him. I'm 29. And um, so there was that four years to get him through high school that I was working for the company Eureka. And that's a great story about why we created a great place to work. So I got offered, I got offered a car, I got offered $50,000, I got offered a jet ski to jump ship to work during the dot-com boom because I did ATL Com, which would allow to take uh, on-prem re programming resources and make them available to the web. And everybody was trying to rush to the web at that point. But Netscape had, had their billion dollar IPO and, and the world was going crazy. But I didn't leave, uh, because money is the number one reason, and you should think about that, but it isn't the only reason. Once a certain threshold is reached, there's lots of reasons people work. So um, taking care of Christopher and, and, and all of that. But he, I drug him to graduation, kicking and screaming, and then, and then he ran away to his grandmother. Then I started my business. And so it was always in the works. And in fact, it wasn't until I met my wife um, who was very successful, she is very smart, but if you meet her, you don't, she doesn't give that impression. She's give, she is silly, and she's blonde, so she's got the dumb blonde thing going on. But that girl is, is smart. She had finished a couple years of college, she had already loaned money from mom, and I'm sitting here looking at her, she's successful, and she's having fun. I was not having fun. Um, so, sorry, long personal story there. I think it would be a long one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I, I will say this, I was an independent contractor and I made uh, a lot more money. I made more money as an independent contractor than I did in my business until 2018. I was not the highest paid person. I've never been the highest paid person other than the, when Vince and I were alone. But since I've had employees, I've not been the highest paid person at my company until 2019. <coughs> and the thing is we reinvest, reinvest. Now don't, nobody's gonna cry for me because the business has value, right? But it's not an ATM. I mean, it's worth millions unless it goes bankrupt tomorrow, right? Then it's worth nothing. So it's only worth something at the end. Um, so it, I will say starting a business was much harder and took a lot longer, uh, but, I, I, but it has a sense of pride. I'm also an anti-authority guy. I still have my rebellious stage, so I don't like working for other people. At McDonnell Douglas, a guy stood in my face and yelled at me, and, and I was stunned. And um, I walked out of the office and I said, that will never happen again. Uh, anybody, you can fire me, but you will never do I didn't know what to do in the moment because it surprised me. So I just sit there, sat there and took it. But I got to tell you, I, I did not like working for other people. I like working for myself. Uh, but you have all the responsibility. I mean, I got to tell you, we had the downturn, the PTSD. I had 25, 26 people working for me. These are my friends. I know their wives. I know their kids. And every one of them. And I had to do a layoff. I had laid four people off. A layoff is firing somebody for your mistakes. That's what a layoff is. It's I screwed up and I'm the owner, but I can't fire myself. I have to fire you because I screwed up. And that sucks. So, yeah. So, it could, you know, ups and downs. Um, I could talk for hours just about entrepreneurship, too. Now I'm in IT because I like to sit. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, do you have any suggestions to like, what field I would be getting into so I can do both? Well, I mean, I tell you, computers today on, on the automobiles with the maintenance things, the way you plug in and stuff, somebody's got to be doing that work, right? Somebody's building those things. Somebody's writing that code. Now, again, I'm a coder, so my mind kind of jumped there. Not really, the, what is the infrastructure part of that? I'm not, I'm not sure. I will say the Shoe Foundation, uh, the Step One Automotive is one of the partners out there. And they, they do, uh, they have class all the time on tearing. They tore down a, a lawnmower engine. Then they went to a four cylinder, a six, and now I think they're doing an eight. And they use, you know, uh, so it's mostly for training classes, but the age range I think is anywhere from like 15 to 25. And I, by the way, I think the age range is anybody who wants to come, but that's the age range that seems to show up. So that might be a great place because the whole point of the Shoe Foundation is to bring all these different, so we're there. We give classes, we, we built rovers, uh, little, little rovers with the kids and uh, Dave Perkins, one of my programmers that does off the wall stuff, he does, we do a laser cutter for Anheuser-Busch, RFID tags for the uh, lumber industry, camera work, I mean, not everything we build is just within the internet, it's, it's functional types of, of coding and whatnot. So I would check out the Shoe Foundation. So, um, I heard step one on what is the Shoe Foundation? Shoe is H-S-U. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's Dr. Sh Dr. Shu. He's a, a Chinese American. Um, um, he has an interesting story. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. I, I didn't even mention the virtualization class. So, again, I, I'm biased towards the, the coders. <laughs> so, uh, and the digital marketing people are doing classes there as well. I don't know all the topics. Um, um, so Tiana is actually kind of coordinating that with each of the divisions. So we give a class in software engineering, IT, and in digital marketing. And then we have the big class. The, the Rover class is a much bigger, longer class. We put a lot into it. We give people Arduino boards. It's a nice setup. And I bet step one does the same thing. And they, they have, they have a, um, I think Triple R Construction does something in there in carpentry. And MAG Aerospace. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the North and does uh, drones and a lot of airspace. So the, the Shoe Foundation is a really interesting place. Free classes. Um, it's a networking opportunity. By the way, she mentioned, whenever you're part of the same group, it, it almost feels like a slight fraternity that comes with that, right? So it's like, oh, you're an HTC student. I'm an OTC student. It's almost like just a little bit of you're going to have preference for that person. So belonging to these different networking groups and whatnot, so, oh, I. I saw you at the shoe foundation. That's awesome. There you go. See, so he's doing something. It's like, um, like I said, with a code fest. So, took some of his own time to go over there and learn something. So, there's a plus one there, <laughs> uh, type of scenario. And you know who you're going to meet there, right? So, Bit Wizards. There, uh, who gave who gave the class? Brian. Brian Schlechter. Yeah. So he's getting a promotion. You guys know more. You, well, no, I'm sorry. That that's so funny. No, that's a true statement. I I promoted him yesterday. 
you guys know that you don't, uh, you know this before the company. So he's going to be the, uh, the, MITS, uh, the MITS technical team manager. And so he's going to be number two to the director of IT. And the, the company, the, the, the thing's getting too big, it's too much work. So uh, yeah, Brian's a great guy, super smart, very Spock-like. He's very Spock -like. even keeled, yes. Very logical. Very logical, just, you know, not a lot of emotion, you know. Azure, uh huh. Well, we were Microsoft shop from way back. So Vince and I, Vince and I were uh, were C plus plus programmers because uh, I did ATL Com and whatnot. So that we used Visual Studio, which was a Microsoft product, and so we got in bed with them early on as a partner because we got certain licensing discounts uh, to do that. So Azure was a huge boon to software engineering because. So Vince and I would build, like we, we built a, a production tracking system for Viva Optique, Viva International. So they have designers in, in, in Italy and they'd have manufacturing in, in China and the headquarters were here in the United States and they're trying to keep all the notes and all the production. One thing I've learned being a programmer is everything is more complicated than you think it is. Something as simple as these glasses, the material that goes into the screws on the side and where it's mined and where it's coming from, you know, the vending. Mined is ridiculous. It doesn't go to that level. It's like the materials used, um, the color dyes, uh, how they're put together, the lenses and whatnot. Um, it's insane. And so we built that. And then we had to deploy it on their systems in IT. So inevitably you have somebody like operations, sales, marketing who wants an application that then has to be deployed in IT who doesn't want to handle another system. <laughs> so we often get resistance. So when Azure came about, the cloud, that was awesome. We could do platform as a service. I don't know if you guys know what that is because you do, okay, platform as a service. You guys probably do a lot of infrastructure as a service type stuff in the cloud, but platform as a service is deploying our workloads directly to the cloud and having those functional things. We no longer had to deal with IT. So we jumped to the cloud. This is how our MITS team got formed because it's not like everybody jumped to the cloud. What we had found was we just had more complex systems. So now we have on-prem talking to private cloud, talking to public cloud. So we'd have you know, somebody have on-prem systems talking to a rack space where maybe they own some servers talking to Azure. And so we ended up hiring a high-end infrastructure engineer, but we couldn't quite keep him busy. And he was the one who kind of talked me into uh, doing the managed IT services, so then Microsoft stole them from me. Damn it! Yeah, so the, the managed, so we do high-end cloud infrastructure consulting, so like for Bells and and Mitsubishi and whatnot, and basically tell them, help them plan out how they might do migrations to the cloud and Azure and other things like that. That's how we started. But the managed IT system is really helping businesses, and so we'll so they don't want to handle their IT assets. They come to us and say, hey, Bit, we'd like Bitwizard to handle our IT assets. So we'll do an assessment. Do you have a firewall? If they don't have one, we're going to put one in. Uh, a Fortinet is usually what we do. They might have, uh, uh, there's a couple, I'm drawing a blank, obviously Cisco, but I'm, there's a couple others, SonicWall and a few others that will support if they already have them. And then after that, like we don't support Gmail. So if they're on Gmail, we upgrade them to, to, to Office 365. We want enterprise class mail that's secure. We, and also get them on a standard set of technologies so that uh, I, I don't want to hire a person like yourself and try to make you uh, an expert in 27 different freaking technologies, we're not going to be very effective. I'd rather for you to go deep in the set of technologies we do and then standardize across all of our customers. I want you to keep the cost down. I can keep the cost lower because you're dealing with the same tool sets, the same types of things. So uh, that's our managed IT services. Um, I don't know if I had it up here or not. I think there might be one that shows our, yeah, there we go. So there's four pillars, application development, digital marketing, managed IT services, and cloud infrastructure. Now, those last two deal with people like yourselves. I mean, this is the skill sets that we have um, that we do. Obviously, the cloud infrastructure stuff is more architecture, less hands-on. It's more planning. So Mitsubishi's not paying us to do it. They're paying us to consult with them to tell them how to do it. Everybody needs this, and people find it different ways. Sometimes they find a guy, right? Some, somebody who has the skills and they hire you to do it. By the way, I do recommend trying to get in with something like that on somebody who, and, and you may not have the great skills, so you may have to do it for free. Uh, or maybe some, you know, <laughs> do it for lunch money or something. <laughs> they give you free whatever that service is for the place. If you have a friend or if you're, you know, your family owns a business, maybe you handle the IT assets, that's the extracurricular activity thing you could put on your resume. I handle the networks for Bob's Donuts you know, 
uh, you know, I put in a firewall for them to help security, blah, 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 blah. I tell the story, right? So, um, so, and of course, if you're good enough at it, you, you don't have to use it for a, a bullet point on your resume. It could be your job. I mean, I, like I said, I made more money being an independent contractor uh, than owning a business for almost 17 years. Um, and, and that's, I just, I was just a hired gun. I, I just did programming uh, for companies that, that needed it. So they, I'd be, you know, go hunt my own food. That's the problem being a contractor. It's feast and famine. You make a lot of money, then you're broke because they have no loyalty to you. And that's, that's, that's what they're paying for. I need you to come in here. I need you to knock this out for me. And then you're out of a job. You pay, you pay a premium for that. You don't get any benefits. You know, I was charging, I think, 90 bucks an hour, which was pretty good in 1998, something like that. So, but remember, I didn't get to build 2,000 hours. I mean, if there's 20, 80 working hours with holidays and stuff, I didn't get to build them all because I'd find a job and it might last a month. And I, I mean, I might work 40, 60 hours in a week knocking something out and then I'm done. And then I gotta go find my next job. There's lots of services now like Elance and other places where you can, contractors a lot, you know. Remember, the internet was a thing, but it wasn't an accepted thing in 1997. I mean, basically Netscape brought it to the forefront of the world in 97, but it wasn't like everybody was on it. Yes, sir. How did you uh, learn how to like, manage a business? Uh, trial and error. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, you know, that's a great question because some, it, it's the same, you don't know what you don't know. The same as the Disney story. You start running a business, I didn't know what I didn't know. And we did it for 10 years. 10 years, there was like 10 of us. Uh, after 10 years, there's about 10 of us. And Vince and I finally said, this isn't what we wanted, this isn't working. And that's when, I, I, by the way, that's about the time I stopped coding. I stopped coding, I start, I, there's a saying that you hear, stop working in your business and start working on your business. And about 2010, that's exactly what I did. I stopped coding and I started working on my business. So I joined Vistage, which is a CEO peer group uh, to, help, uh, to help business training. I did a lot of classes, my best friend, uh, Vince is the CEO. He ended up going uh, to Notre Dame. He got a, a, he joined the executive MBA program from from Notre Dame, and he graduated. He's a Notre Dame fanboy. Everything in his office is Notre Dame. But uh, yeah, uh, it it is a skill. It it is a different skill, and um, it, it's I, it's a lesson I don't seem to learn, because. As an engineer, every time I had a problem, I'd go get a book. I mean, you guys run the internet, but I'd go grab a book. You just go and get a book on the topic that you didn't read it. And so I tell you, the hardest thing, so I've been in the military and uh, got a pretty hard degree and started multiple successful businesses. Hardest thing I ever did in my life was raise my sister's son for four years. Hardest thing I ever did in my life. Oh my God, we, I mean, it was a nightmare. I was too young, I'm 29, I didn't know. But it took me two years before I picked up a book on how to raise a teen. And I'm, oh, I'm doing that wrong. So, so for me, work was freedom. For me, work was money and money was freedom. Uh, my mom was working her butt off. I was basically unsupervised all the time. So that's, I kind of went off the deep end doing some bad stuff, but I had two things going for me. One, I was smart. I'm just lucky that book smart comes to me. Puzzles, all that kind of thing. I suck at mechanics. I cannot build anything. I do not fix my car. Um, those kind of things, but with ethereal logic is, is my forte, and I was not afraid to work. So when I'm raising Christopher, I was, you got to get good grades before you're allowed to work. He was lazy. I did not do any favors for him, and it hurt him later in life because I didn't instill that work ethic in him. So I tell that story to say um, anything you do, you know, you know, we expect to be good at everything. Baloney, you've got to put effort into anything you want to learn how to do. And so there's, there's avenues out there. Be a good parent, be good at IT. Uh, learn, like I said, I took a sailing, I've been sailing for 20 years on the 16 foot catamarans. I decided to upgrade. I took a class, I there's what, find out what I didn't know. Navigation and other things on a 30 foot Catalina is a little bit different than a 16 foot catamaran. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I think I was dumb in that the first 10 years I didn't actually go seek resources on how to be an entrepreneur. Uh, it is a different skill than technology. If you ask, if, if you ask Vince, my partner, the most important lesson for being an entrepreneur, he says ruthless persistence. Um, I will say, uh, with Mike Rowe talks about a sensible road though. Here's the thing is, Vince and I are confident enough to, to believe in ourselves, to keep driving forward. 
but we're also humble enough to never think we know what's going on. Even today, we question ourselves, and it is good. Vince has been my best friend for 40 years, and I will say being a business partner with somebody who's like a marriage, it can be, it can be hostile. It can be really difficult. It's good we have such a strong foundation. Um, it can be really tough to go into business with somebody you don't know well enough because you will differ and it can cause trouble. On the flip side, if you have a partner, it gives you somebody to challenge you, you know, that you, okay, I think this is the best idea. Why? Tell me why. Think it through. Somebody who's going to make me, force me to think it through. And even if it's a good idea, I have to think deeper because I have a partner. So we challenge each other. We make each other sharper um, um, uh, doing that. Lifelong learner is one of our core values. We have six, by the way. It's ownership thinking, be the magic, lifelong learner, live the wizard life, which is service, our slang for service mentality. Um, uh, make it so, it's a little Star Trekking thing, drive forward, which we don't fire from mistakes. So on the lifelong learner, a lot of companies, they like, we want lifelong learner, but then they don't do anything with it. So we have programs. So one, we finance it. So any classes, tests, and stuff like that, we pay for them, um, uh, uh, for the person. We expect you to do it on your own time, but if it has to be done during working hours, like if you're at a seminar that's during working hours, we count it as work. So we don't make you use your leave uh, for training. Uh, of course, it's gotta be approved, but as long as it's in tune with that, uh, I'm a big, huge believer in, in uh, uh, this field. I haven't written code in 12 years. I would not hire myself to write code. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the world has changed. The world has changed. Um, mobile development, I did some mobile development way early, like in 2005 on the old Compaq iPad. It was like this big old thing. Do you, do you remember it? Yeah. Windows CE. Was running Windows CE, yeah. Windows CE was running on that. What a crap operating system. It was terrible. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, but today, I mean, we're using Xamarin Forms. I, kn I know the names, but uh, we use GitHub for source control. I know the names. I don't know how to use the tools, ADO items. I'm just, I'm just spouting the jargon. I can't actually do the work anymore. Yeah, let's thank you. Okay, there we go. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>